hello, uh, hello everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Karen Blondin Hall. I work at the Department of Health and Social Services with the Aboriginal Health and Community Wellness Team. Uh, and I'm moderating this panel titled Students of the Land. I would first like to thank the panel members for being here and sharing their wisdom and their knowledge. Uh, and I will start by introducing each of them. Going up first is Lois Phillip. She's the school principal of Dega School for Providence. She has developed an extensive land-based curriculum at the school, including students spending up to four weeks on the land. Uh, each of you have about 15 minutes. I'll give you a little signal, a five and then a two for two minutes left. Um, or 10. Um, and then I will introduce each of you um, when she's done. Thank you. Go ahead. Hello, everybody. Um, I am from the date show. I, am, I grew up in Fort Providence. Um, and I am now the principal at the school that I, that I once went to. Um, I'm a little bit nervous, but I'll just power through this. This is kind of like the approach that I take to most things. People ask me to do things, and I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, why not? And then the day of, I'm like, what the hell did I get myself into? So here I am. Um, I have been very fortunate to work in a community that has embraced everything that we do in the school. Um, we, we, I sent out a handout. I only had 50 of them. I wasn't sure how many people were going to be here. But we approach every year with a planning calendar. And we approach every year saying, OK, what is really important for our youth? What do we want them to do? Um, and we start off at the K level. Every kid in K to 3 will spend four to six weeks out on the land at the beginning of the school year. We start our school year at the beginning of August with the intent that August and September are really nice times of the year and our kids need to be outside. They will then spend a week out on the land in the winter at our winter camps. Those are just day trips for the little ones and then they'll spend two weeks out on the land in May at our summer spring camps. Um, our primary students Sorry, our elementary students, so those students in grades four to six, will spend one week out on a boat trip. Um, if you know anything about many northern communities, families came in from out of the, on the land. So we take our kids out on the river and show them where their families, their nine families that came in off the land into the community, where they're from. Um, they do that once in grade four, once in grade five, and once in grade six. They will also spend a week out on the land in the winter, um, down at Horn River, which is about 20 miles down river, uh, learning how to set traps, how to set a net, how to winter survival skills, etc. cetera. Um, and then they'll spend two weeks out on the land in May. By the time our kids graduate, I think I looked at it once, they can spend up to 50 weeks out on land programs by the time they get to grade 12. It, I believe really grounds our kids in who they are and what's really important. If I look at our kids, right now we have 23 that are enrolled in post-secondary outside of the community, of which the 23, I believe it's 21 of them are, are attending post-secondary outside of the territory. So I think that speaks well to the connection that we try to give our kids, our young people, with knowing who they are and knowing where they come from and what's important. Um, oh, it's really hot. What's really important to us is building partnerships. Um, we've been able to build a, a relatively good partnership with schools from the Hay River Reserve from McClavick and Fort McPherson. Um, right now we have kids from all four of those schools in Costa Rica on an experiential learning outdoor education trip, um, taking part in a workshop called Agents of Change. It's just one of the th one of four camps that that kids that join the keepers get to do. Um, they start off of, with a winter camp. So three weeks ago, we had kids up in Fort McPherson um, doing a winter camp. The second part of the 
Second trip for the two-year program is they will then do a two-week canoe trip in June, um, followed by a trip to Costa Rica the following, I guess, March, um, and then following with a forest ecology camp. Each, all of these trips we do on a budget of less than $40,000. Um, it's been a process over many, many years of being able to build up our inventory so that when we want to do a land-based trip, really the only cost that, that we incur are those in terms of hiring the manpower. Um, we're, we really work with our teachers to make sure that they have the skills necessary to take the kids out on the land, whether it's whether they become canoe instructors, whether we get them certified in advanced wilderness, wilderness first aid, whether they become whatever is out there that will build their skill set, I think is really important that we begin to support the education institutions in our communities. I think, um, I think schools are a natural venue to, to get our kids out on the land. Um, I, know that, I know that our parents don't want our kids to leave at 17, 18. I think it's, it's young for our kids to transition from a small northern community into a large post-secondary institution. So we look at it and say, okay, I think it's really important that we offer as many opportunities as we can. On the back, there's a couple websites. Um, and if you visit them, there's a large number of photos that will give you a really good sense of what we do. Every second or third year, we work to bring kids up to Willow Lake in Deje. Um, and we bring them up between four to six weeks with families. When they're up there, we, we don't send anything other than the basics, and then they're required to hunt and fish for everything else. Um, we find that after six weeks, the kids and the families that come back into the community are much healthier. Um, they have spent six weeks without sugar. They have spent six weeks without pop and chips, which is really, you can see the difference in terms of some of the health implications. Um, the first time we did it, we did a bunch of testing. Oh, I didn't think I'd be so nervous. Uh, the first time we, we sent kids up, we did a bunch of health testing. Adults on average lost in the six weeks about 20 pounds. The kids lost about 15 pounds. And it was just because you're out in the bush and you're moving and you're busy and you're hauling your own water and you're chopping your own wood and you're doing all of those things that are really, really necessary for survival up there. Um, and we find that once they come back, they want to go back. They, they find communities extremely disruptive in terms of some of those social challenges we face. It's, I think, offering these kind of opportunities in our schools begin to impact some of the social challenges in, in a positive way. Um, knock on wood, we've never had a suicide in the community. I know that we've had a suicide attempts, but we've never had a successful suicide. And, and I look at that and I say, okay, in many ways our kids are extremely grounded, um, but they face every challenge that I think every other northern community faces that just being able to ground them, I think, really empowers them in many ways. And then when, they, when they're able to, when they do graduate and go off to post-secondary, they take those experiences with them, knowing that there are times that it is going to be very stressful, but they do have the skills to, to do well. Um, so what we do is, is we look at this and we, we sit down in about May, end of April, beginning of May, and look at it and say, okay, what's really important? What are the dates that we want to do things? Um, and we do it from K to 12, as well as our staff. So this year coming up, we're, our staff cultural orientation, um, we will boat from Providence to Simpson as a staff for our regional orientation. And in that process, it allows those staff members from away to really connect. Our K 
K to three program is in our local language. Um, it it's a start. I think that we need to really encourage more people in the community to converse with our young ones in the language. So by the time they get to grade four, they have a fairly good working working knowledge of the language. We just haven't got over that one hurdle of saying, now you need to speak it continuously. Um, we are right now in the process of wrapping up a two-year UVic language revitalization program diploma course. Um, so we will, when I get back after spring holidays, do a, an intensive three-week Denisha T immersion program for all high school students. So for three weeks, we will pull them out of English and math and sciences, and they'll only be working in the language. It's being from the community, I think, has given me, whoa, it's coming down my glasses. <laughs> um, has, has given us a lot of latitude and freedom to try to do things in a way that, um, whoa. Um, has, has given us a lot of latitude and freedom to try things and if they don't work we just kind of go oh well we'll try something different um, and it has been a wonderful journey and it it's you see the kids when they come back from a land program you see the kids come into the school and they're so much lighter and so much engaged until we beat it out of them not intentionally though um, so you know, in terms of terms of school, the youth and schools and institutions, if we could see a greater collaboration, if we could see a greater um, voice from parents saying that this is what we need, this is what we want, and a greater understanding within our communities that that education needs to be owned by the communities rather than the institutions. I think that every school in the NWT should work towards developing an intensive land-based programming because it really does pay off in the end. Um, you know, I see our kids and our youth and the things that they're, they're now pursuing despite or in spite of all the challenges that they face outside of the school are are things that I think really empower communities. I must be at 10 minutes. <laughs> I'm good, I'll just wait till questions later. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lois, uh, for sharing. That was a, an incredible, um, very inspiring. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have Mandy McDonald. She's the Director of Land-Based Education at the Shinta Center for Research and Learning. She is a Mushkego S. Cueo transplant in Sambake Denende. She's a novice Musai Tanner and the Program Manager at the Shinta Bush University. Thanks, Karen. I'm the, uh, okay. Thanks for going first, Lois. Mandy McDonald, Natsi Kassin, Mandau Sipik Otsinia, Muskegu Nia. My name is Mandy McDonald. I'm originally from Churchill, Manitoba, um, which I'm told is traditionally known in Cree as Mandau Sipik, which means the river of strangers, which I think is really cool. And I've been living here in Sambake for 20 years. Um, I'm the program director at the Chinta Bush University Center for Research and Learning, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about um, a project that we will be running this summer. Um, so first, I really want to acknowledge some of the our core faculty that are here. Um, Paul McKenzie was around somewhere. He's one of our instructors, and Mila Nakeko. Um, 
Fred Zangris, who's taught with us before, Bobby Dragis, um, what else is here? Aaron Freeland Ballantyne, our ED faculty. Thank you all very much. Oh, Ryan's here too. Ryan's taught with us, Ryan McMahon. Yeah, just wanted to point those people out. They're a really important part of our program. People have taught with us in the past. So, Dichinta, I'm just going to give you a really sort of brief background on the program, and then I'll spend the rest of my time talking about a rivers project that we're running this summer. So, Dichinta does land-based university accredited programming uh, on Chief Draghi's territory primarily at Blatchford Lake Lodge. Um, we do, our courses are accredited through the Faculty of Native Studies at the University of Alberta, the University of British Columbia, and McGill University. So the academic content is um, very much critical history on the col coloni uh, critical history of colonization in Canada, decolonization, indigenous resurgence, um, environmental and social determinants of health, sustainable energy, sustainability, um, communications, and things like that. And then it's a land-based program, so by that I mean the land is acknowledged and recognized as a primary teacher in the program. We do things like moose hide tanning and setting fish nets, making dry fish, hunting, harvesting medicines, preparing medicines, and things like that. We usually do two semesters a year and then a few weeks of programming in the summer. So we're six to eight weeks long on the land. That's the intensive land-based component of the program, but the actual semester is about 16 weeks long. Um, so students have six to eight weeks on the land for the intensive, and then they have um, weeks after that to finish a community-based project in their home community. So this summer, we got Canada 150 funding to do three six-week-long programs um, on the rivers. So we're running three river expeditions simultaneously, um, and this is what we're proposing. So. One will be the wind peel trip. We uh, are proposing to do the Horton and the Decho. So each pro project is six weeks long. That includes one to two weeks of training on the front end. So that training will be uh, our core curriculum, critical history of colonization, uh, looking at specific policies and legislation in Canada and how it impacts First Nations communities. And on top of that, we'll be doing whitewater training. So then one to two weeks of that on the front end, three or four weeks of paddling, and then a week of debrief and community gathering at the end. And so our panel is on students of the land. Um, for me, I was a student in Dechinta in 2011. I did the one-week short course. That was when Dechenta hosted the Royal Couple. Um, and I was in my third year of my undergraduate degree at the time at the University of Victoria. I did my BA in political science and my MA in indigenous governance. When I was done my coursework, sorry. Ah. I have to apologize to the speakers today because I had to keep going in and out to take calls. So we're planning, like I said, planning three river trips right now, and then our semester program starts April 3rd, and then right after that we have a one-week short course intensive, and then right after that we have the rivers trips. So a couple of things I wanted to talk to you about today is um, students of the land. So I think we're all here today because we really see or know the value in being on the land or going out on the land, taking people out on the land, and what that means to us personally for our own personal, mental, emotional, physical health, and then trying to facilitate those opportunities for other people in an as safe way as possible. So one of the challenges that I think we face as institutions is trying to balance our the expertise and knowledge of our indigenous elders, cultural knowledge holders, and the what they the authority they have on the land. And then as institutions having to fit within certain standards um, and follow certain rules in terms of liability and insurance. So for our rivers trip, for example, we need to have a certain number of people that meet the 
industry standard of whitewater guiding, which is, for example, 80-hour wilderness first aid course, uh, instructor-level Paddle Canada training, um, swift water rescue, and things like that. And at the same time, we need all of our regional leaders and knowledge holders, and their expertise is not acknowledged in the same way by those uh, accreditation institutions. So I think what a lot of the speakers were talking about today really speaks to the challenge that we face as well, and it's that this morning John Bezo was saying, back in the day, you just go out with a rifle and a tent. And the, but today, to take people out on the land, you need insurance and you need all this gear. You need to make sure people are safe and not just the material gear, but you need to make sure that people are emotionally prepared for being out on the land. So it can be very challenging um, for people, especially in our program, because the content we teach can be quite difficult and triggering. And for a lot of our students, it might be the first time that they've really had the opportunity and the guidance from people to think about the history of colonization in Canada and how that relates to the challenges that they see in their own community. Um, so one thing that we're working on at Dechinta is providing, trying to provide much better mental health and wellness support on site for people. So I'm really interested in speaking to the two ladies who spoke before me. I'm sorry I had to take a call for part of your presentation, but I think the work that you're doing sounds really amazing in Nome. Um, so, yeah, the, so, what was I saying? Okay. <coughs> okay, lots of time. So, I'm really happy about this summit because I've already met a uh, few people who are really going to be really good to connect with in terms of this Rivers project. So for each one, let me tell you a little bit more about each one. With the Dead Show, the, we're proposing to start in, in Providence and paddling all the way up to Fort Good Hope. And then with the wind peel, we'll be, we're proposing to do the training in and around Whitehorse and then putting it at McCleskey Lake and paddling up to Fort McPherson. With the Horton, we're looking at starting in Horton Lake and paddling up to the ocean and then along the ocean to Polytech. So our students typically are 18 and over. There's no prerequisites to apply, so you don't necessarily need a high school diploma to come to us. Uh, we have our own application process and intake process and then students will complete the University of Alberta admissions paperwork, and then they'll be admitted under special student status for the semester. For each of the river trips, the total group will be about 16 or 18 people, and that includes the leadership team. So we've been taught with our core, um, the Chinta faculty and staff, been talking about a model for a leadership team that includes the cultural knowledge holders, the elders that will be on the trip, our Dechinta facilitators who have experience teaching on site in the land-based context, and then the sort of industry level white water guiding people, which we are calling the water safety people um, because it's just a little bit, because it's a little bit problematic to refer to the, to these people as guides who will be guiding elders through their own territory. So they'll be primarily responsible for the safety of people on the water. And then we'll also have two communications people on each team. So that leaves room for about six to eight students per trip. And we haven't actually done a, a big public call out for students yet, but we'll be rolling that out in the next month. Um, so if you please talk to me after. I've made some connections today, which was really, really good. And uh, if you are interested in participating as an instructor or a support staff person or as a student, please get in touch with me. I'll be hanging around all day and um, tomorrow and tonight. 
And I really want to say again, thank you to the speakers that I heard today. I thought everything that was said was really awesome, and it's really exciting to be in a room full of people who are doing work and on the land programming. And so far, I feel like it's been really refreshing. And I think we have a lot to learn from each other. And I think it's really innovative, the work that everyone is doing. And so thanks. And thank you so much for inviting me to speak. <laughs> Okay, Masi, Mandy, uh, do you have a website? Yeah. It's dechinta.ca. Okay. Okay, so up next we have Norman Yakalea. Mr. Yakalea served with the Talita Dene Band as a band counselor from 1987 to 1990 before being elected chief. He was also the chair of the Satu Tribal Council and served as MLA for the Satu region. Yeah, I'd be fine here. Yeah, thank you. Hey, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, I was very excited to be asked if I would uh, speak today. About a month ago or so, I said, yes, no problem. I'll be happy to. And last night I said, what the heck did I get myself into? Writing my notes, reading my notes, making all kind of changes, and I'm listening to the other great speakers that came up here and were talking. It seemed so natural, and uh, it seemed so at ease. And um, especially with uh, the topic I'm going to talk about is on the canal project that I've taken on a few years back. And I'm going to speak in front of the uh, older people. Uh, Jimmy Dillon is our elder from Dillene. And uh, Paul Andrews from my hometown, in the Shuta Kutene peoples. So I'm going to talk about being on the land. And I have uh, my friend here, the Honorable Minister Glenn Abernathy, and, and looking at me. and. I think he's got some questions for me later on. I love Glenn, and the Deputy Minister, Deputy Lancey, was my partner on the Cannell Hike last year. And uh, in politics, sometimes we agree to disagree, and we had some issues last year. And you know what? I still love her after the issues that we talked about, because <laughs> she was my partner. And I got a young fellow like Jordan Lenny, who's a relative of mine, just come out of Bennett Field and on a program there. There's many other people. There's former chief here, and there's Chief Roy Fabian, some other leaders here that I know from the other territories. It's a real honor to, to speak to you. And uh, especially the elders, I don't want to get it wrong. I want to, like the Cove Lake elder said, tell a good story. You know, tell a good story. And uh, I got to be very, very careful of my story. You see, I, um, I also practice karate, Japanese karate, Goju Rai. I'm um, pretty close to a, a black belt. I'm on a brow belt. One more belt to go. It takes two years to get a black belt if you do 15 hours a week. And uh, when you go into a grade, into a karate, you go before, when you get to grade to another belt level, you go in, uh, into a mindset when you train for three, four months, years. And you sit like this, and you go up there, and you, um, you practice what you learned to get another belt. And the belts, the black belts are sitting in front of you. And you go up there, and you just, oh, I hope I don't make a mistake. And they sit like this. Show me your stuff. See how good you are. And then they bark out the commands for you to do. And you do that, and you're sweating. And you do the best you can. And they don't say nothing. They say, mm-hmm. They give you another command. You do another. Mm-hmm. Do a kata. Mm-hmm. OK, you're going you're gonna to spar against the black belt. Second degree, maybe, or third degree black belt. Spar. 
and you spar about six minutes to ten minutes. And they go, hmm, and they sit like this, and they're right. Go, oh, man, I hope I did well. And a grading takes about two hours. I just sweating. It takes about two hours to get graded. And after you finish grading, you go to, oh, God, I could have done better. God, I should have done this. It just was too slow. You know, and after, you either, they either pass you or they give you a, a little lower grade than you expected. I guess the point I want to get, that your work that you guys do today, that you do today is well worth it. And that's what you pass on to the younger people. They got to do their own push-ups. You can't do the push-ups for them. They have to do the push-ups. They have to do the work. And all I am and all what I do today, I owe to my mother. And I want to honor this talk to my mother, who's given me all what I am today. It's because of her. And to the elders. And I hope I do a good job telling you the story. And the black belt, it'll come when I'm ready. So they asked me to do a talk on the lessons I learned from 11 years of walking in the mountains. It's the first time I'm using this type of presentation. I like it. <laughs> so every journey starts with the first step. So how did I start this journey? Well, 2006, I was flying from Fort Good Hope to Norman Wells with then the Premier Joe Hanley. And as we flew over from Fort Good Hope to Norman Wells, I looked across the mountains and I saw the mountains and I sat in the plane coming down and I heard my little grandmother's voice, go walk in the mountains. And I remember my grandmother, when I was a young boy, sitting with her. And she would tell me stories. And then one day she told me, go walk in the mountains. Why would my grandmother say that? And I would say, just to get my grandmother not to talk about it, say, yeah, okay, Granny, yeah, sure. How many of you have done that? Just to please your parents or your grandparents. Yeah, yeah, okay, do that. And I thought about it. Why would my grandmother would say this? My grandmother's name is Harriet Gladue. My other grandmother is Elizabeth Yakalaya. I'm talking about my grandmother Harriet Gladue this time. She was married to Chief Albert Wright, who signed the treaty in 1921 in Toledo. And my grandmother told me many stories about my grandfather. My grandmother talked about the times when the Paul's parents and his relatives walked from Tulita to Ross River, do some trading, a little bit of a joint venture, walk all the way back to Tulita, then walk up to Fort Good Hope and walk back about her life in the mountains. And she told me those stories. And I said, yeah, Granny, yeah, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, go, I'll do that. I was wondering, why would she say that? You see, somewhere along, I lost that dream. I lost it. I went to residential school, and that memory slowly went somewhere, faded away. You see, I lost myself in the residential school system. People talk about becoming another person. Truly, truly it is. You become somebody who you aren't. You know, when I became that person, and I thought this was the person is this what you want to see? I'll show you what you want to see. Not really know who, who, and I am, who I am. And so over the years, I forgot about what my grandmother said to me. Until one year, I sobered up. Just about 30 years now, been sober. And slowly, 
slowly I've started to go back and listen and say, find out who I am. And that was the day that I flew over the mountains and I heard my grandmother said, go walk in the mountains. And I just had that burning desire. You know when you have that? You just want to do something? You know, I had some of those crazy days when I'm drinking too, when I just wanted to do something. Well, it got me in trouble. <laughs> this time I just wanted to do something. I just felt that burning desire, that passion to say yes. Yes, let's do it. And that's what Joe Hanley said in the plane. Do what? I said, we're going to walk in that mountains. <laughs> really? I said, sure, I just feel I have to go walk. <laughs> really, Norman? I said, yeah, let's do it. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but let's go. Really? You want to go? I said, yes, I'm with you, man. Really, Joe? Let's go and do it, Joe. That's when I had that burning desire, that passion, and to walk in the mountains. I didn't know how to do it. You see, I didn't know nothing. But I thought I knew everything. I knew nothing of Paul's country and his people. Nothing, except what my granny said. Where to walk, when she was telling me. You walk in the mountains, you'll see big mountain scrapes on the side, she said. That was when the eagle was flapping its wing, going between the valleys, scraping the mountains. When the big eagle head is on the the head is on a mountain. You'll see it. When you go to areas where you can't sleep because that's where people are buried in the shape, the ground will shake. Don't sleep there. Don't sleep there. Just walk through. Many stories. And I just said, okay, Joe, let's go. So every journey starts with the, starts with one step first. You got to take that one step. You got to move it one ahead of you. Sometimes it's shaky. And lessons that I learned, three, three things I can tell you, the lessons that I learned, know what you want, know your outcome, know what you want to do. What is that you want? What's your dream? Two important things in life you, got, you should remember, must remember. The day you were born, the day you found out the reason why you were born. What's your purpose? What did God give you to say, this is the reason why you're born? This is the reason why you're sitting right here. This is the reason why I give you life. What's your purpose? And I thought when I got on the trail, that's my purpose. Is this why I'm born? To be an MLA? To be a chief? To be a land claim negotiator? To be a drug and alcohol counselor? To be a trainer? To be a father? To be a recovering alcoholic? To be a drunk in Toledo? What's my purpose? Why am I here? What is I'm supposed to do? What's my contribution to life? And taking these young kids out on the trail it's all about life. It's all about life. Nothing more, nothing less. And I tell the kids, I want to stay alive. I want to stay alive out here. Nothing matters in Norman Wells and Toledo and Yellowknife. Right here and right in front of me, I want to stay alive. And I want to keep you alive. So let's help each other. So take what you need, nothing more. The iPhones come, they go in the back, cell phone go. I need your ears, your nose, your mouth, everything. Sensory acuity. Keep your senses open. They tried, I said, they, they will whistle sometimes on the, on the trail, say, oh, don't whistle. The old man that was here and the young one over there, they're curious. They're going to come towards you. I don't want them beside us. They're, I'm fine without them. I'm really, really fine. They know we're here. They know we're there. 
And we know that they know that we're here. Let's just keep them that way. I need you. I need you. Listen. Listen to the mountains. Listen to the water. Listen to the trees. Listen to that wind. Listen. Listen to yourself. What's all that negative talk going on? I can't do it. Oh, are you crazy? Why are we out here anyhow? Yeah. Right, Deb? After 10 miles of walking, walking 65 pounds on your pack? Yeah? Crazy old man, what are you doing out here? I need you. Take what you need, nothing more. You're packing your world. You should see some of the packs that got jeans and all that. So you don't need this. Nobody's there. Even $20, you don't need this. So everything's right in front of you. So take what you need. I said in life, there's obstacles, obstacles, obstacles can be overcome. That's where the real growth happens. Stretch yourself. There's obstacles in your life because you know what, you guys? When we pray, we ask for strength and growth and challenges. God says, okay, here. Here's an obstacle. Let's see how much you want it. Let's see your strength. Let's see you get your overcome those, un those get uncomfortable. On the land is uncomfortable sleeping, on the rocks and the raining. We walked 30 miles one time in, in rain every day. Soaking wet going to bed. Soaking wet getting up. I love the candle. I love the candle. Yeah, right. Who do you think you're kidding? I just want to go somewhere dry. Obstacles are going to be in your way. They're part of life. That's how you grow. That's how you really want your dreams. God's going to give it to you. So be careful what you pray for. Because I was praying that, gee, there might not be anybody this afternoon, but God said, no, I'm going to have to heaven. Cause this big wind here, everybody's sitting here. <laughs> Thank you, God. <laughs> Ask for help if you need it. The guy in the middle is my son. His name is Chase. He's 6'1", he's 15 years old, grade 10. Dad, why do you walk on the candle every year? Ever since he was young. It took him about two years ago. Now I know why you walk on that. I love it out there. This is at an elders camp. We've got a junior ace camp on a candle hike. 13 and 12 years old. We're not quite, you know, you got the mind is strong, but the body's not there yet. We put you in a junior's camp, how to live in the bush. We teach you out there how to get in relationship with the land, with the water, with the trees. We teach you there, that old man there in the front, about learning first aid, Dene style. Because out there, you, you're going to learn to have, you need first aid. And how to start getting in a relationship with the land. And how to do, start doing things. And that's the elders camp. So we ask for help if you need it. There's no shame and not asking. Ask for it. This is Edward Udzi, 76 years old. Was with him last week in Cobo Lake. And he said, Norm, we got to share our stuff. It's time to share. We can't keep it to ourselves. And this is what we're doing this afternoon. We're sharing. And listen to the elders. Paul Andrews, Uncle Fred Andrews Sr., old man, lovely old man. And that's who I went to see. My mom asked, if, uh, who do I go see? My mom said 30 years ago, go see the old man. So I went to see him. Know nothing. I know nothing. And he said, even though I talked to you, put the paper in in your pocket because one day you're going to take it out and you're going to say, oh yeah, that's what he meant. Put it away because I might not, you might not understand what I'm saying right now. And listen to the elders. Last week, 
I asked the old man in Cobo Lake, what is that we need to do as young people? And the elder said, we're here to talk to you. The young kids are to listen to us and just listen. But you see, my people, we raised in a different culture, raised in residential schools where in school we're taught to ask questions and get answers right away. And elders say, no, no, no. In our school you listen. I know you're trained this way. and It is not your fault. But us, we're taught to, li to listen. It's like a fish, you got no ears, young people. Listen. So that's all the elders have said. I said, thank you. Out there, have fun because life, when you look at it, life is really short. Man, life goes fast. You know what, I'm, I'm 58 years old, thanks to Facebook. Everybody knew the other day it was my birthday. <laughs> Here, it's going to be really nice and calm and quiet about it. You know what? I never thought at this age that, that I would still be doing this work. And I love it. I went to see my father-in-law the other day. He's 90 years old. He said, Norm, my glasses, my eyes are no good. And he's taking all both of his false teeth and he's pulling out his earplugs. And he says, I'm 90 years old. He said, but I don't feel it. I said, yes. I'm 58 years old and I don't feel it. The land will keep you young. The land will keep you young compared to the trees and the mountains. That's life. Life. Have fun. Forgot to have, to have fun. Always serious. You know, when I was in MLA, always serious looking. <laughs> serious stuff. I'm serious for dealing with millions and billions of dollars. And, you know, <laughs> serious. I got to read, yeah? Man, oh man, what a fool I was. <laughs> Beautiful people I work with, the other MLAs, the ministers. They're good people. It just, we just get caught up in some other, I can't say the word because it's broadcast with other poop, but, uh, you know, they really want to do well. It's a system. It's a system. Well, you know what? We're in this environment where we can change it. You can change it. You're already changing it. It's amazing. Life is good in the bush. It's the best. The best of the best. And that's who you are right here on this table. You are the best of the best. Good company to be in. Because you believe in your dreams, you believe in the challenges, and you said, get out of the way, I'm going to do it. Come on, life, give me some more. Oh, yes. Come on, Mike Tyson, put him up. I could take it. Buster Douglas, he whipped Mike Tyson's ass. <laughs> he believed in himself. You know what I mean? Life is good in the bush. Got to believe that, man. Like Phil says in Yukon, life is good out there. And I really got it walking in the mountains. Man, it's beautiful. I know what, I know what Paul says when they get up in the morning. And they, hey, hey, sing like that. Life is good. Thank you, Creator. Thank you, Creator. Appreciate another day. Teach me. Of course, out in the bush, learning life, you learn the old ways. You're 65 pounds on your back, walking 40 miles sometimes, 10 miles a day. After the first mile, you really learn the old ways. 
how to cross the river. When you look at the river, you see the water after the sun is sweating, it's dirty above and you're sweating. And you kneel down in front of the water and you slowly take the hand and drink it. Because the water looks at you, the water looks at you and takes your picture. Remembers you forever. Plenty of water. You see, when we get young, we just run to the water. And the elder said, no, 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 no. Don't do that. We don't understand the water yet. Even today, we don't understand the water. That's how powerful it is. You're not the boss yet. We don't understand the water yet. And we're still trying to figure it out for how many hundreds of years. And we still don't know about it yet. But the water will take your picture. So watch how you talk about water. It will remember you forever. Forever. Rest while you can. It's my friend from Odie Hansen from McLaren. Went on the trail with me. Sure different flying over the Canal Trail at 10,000 feet above the ground. Walking on the ground level, he said, it sure, sure fools you. That's how the Canal Trail is. That's how the land is. One step in front of the other. So when we hike, we rest while we can. In life, rest while you can. We live in this Wild and crazy way of life. Where we just go, 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 go. We don't really rest. But when you're in the bush, the bush will take care of you. And rest when you have to. It's a totally different way of life. So take care of the land and it'll take care of you. I got two more slides and I'm just about done there. Uh, take care of the land and the land will take care of you. Don't underestimate the small things that you're doing now because it'll mean a big, big, big thing. You see, when we take taking these young kids, so far, 65 youth have walked the trail with me. Over 155 other people have walked with me. And we start walking the trail from mile 222 to the Mackenzie River. And Myself, Miles Herbs, and Joe Hanley, and Garth Walbridge. We walked the whole trail, 222 miles, and Miles and myself went back. So we got about, five, about 400 miles on, in the mountains walking over the last 11 years. What we found out was from the Canal Trail was a World War II project. They built the pipeline, they built the road, and they built a, a, a telephone line to support the World War II uh, U.S. Army effort to get oil from Norman Wells to Whitehorse and into, up to, into Alaska. 30,000 men, they built in 13 months. This project was bigger than the Panel Canal project. At that time in 1943, 44, 45, it was recorded budget of 300 million. Probably now an estimated dollars, couple of bi several billion dollars. But what they forgot to do was clean up the land. And they left the telephone wire there. And over the years, the telephone lines deteriorated and fell on the ground and then get caribou getting caught up in the telephone wire line. These are lead copper telephone line wires. So 2006 till about two years ago, we've been every year, we've been in the paper saying, you know, clean up the land and all this, getting the federal government. And we, young people out there, youth are out there, they've seen it. You know, and the young people walked and walked, and every year we would put this on the, uh, uh, through the radio, thanks to CBC's New North and CKLB, where we get good coverage on this. And what we did was basically shame the federal government, clean up your mess. And they found a way to get the money, and we're picking up the wire. And also we picked up close to about 16 antlers on the Canal Trail. This year will be... The, 65 more miles left to go, and the whole wire will be cleaned up on 222 miles. But it's these young people 
year after year, walking the trail and exposing it and shaming the government. Someone's got to be responsible. So what you are doing, if you don't see the results, you are going to be making results. Have patience. It's coming. It's there. And the federal government so far I think came up pretty close to over two, about $2 million cleaning up this trail. And that's what we saw. That was just a fresh caribou. They were still breathing, went to, went to saw and had to shoot it. But we saw 16 more of antlers like that that were picked up on the Canal Trail. So you are making a difference. That's the power in the young people and yourself. You doing what you have to do to get on the land. <clears throat> when the going gets tough, just keep chugging along. There's nowhere else to go. One step in front of the other. That's in the valley. That's the young hikers. That's the country we walk in. And these young people are amazing. Amazing. They don't even know the hidden strength and talents within them. We really stretch their comfort zone. We really push them to walk. After the first mile, we sit and we rest and we have a little chat. Because all at the beginning of the, time, of the, of the hike, they know everything. And I say, uh-huh, uh-huh. After a mile, not too much, uh-huh. And after the first mile, two, three miles, rest, then they get, start to get it. And after the second day, they really start to get it. And the third day, they want to go home. Can't take this anymore. It's too hard. Just finished five miles of walking. 65 pounds on your back. And they don't even talk to you. <laughs> when we're going to rest, Norm? The, fa the, the, only, the only question they have now is, how far? How far? How far? You know, and our favorite answer is, it's just over there. <laughs> just over there. Just around the corner. You know what? They start out, and some give up. Some don't all make it, and that's okay. Part of life. Part of life. How much you want it. How much are you willing to sacrifice to get your goal, to reach it? What are you willing to do? What are you willing to sacrifice? And that's where, when you go through that, that's where the magic happens. It truly happens. You become outstanding. You become outstanding. Mother Nature really is the boss. And no better example than this afternoon. Mother Nature is the boss. That's in a cannon that we walked into. It goes about, to about a mile and a half. At the end of the cannon is a big waterfall, just like in Brazil. Different colors, waters. Beautiful in there. It's magic in there. Echo Canyon. And you walk in there, it's like a real deep freeze. It's cold. And what we learned on the Canal Trail that Mother Nature is the boss, and you better learn to respect Mother Nature and learn from her right away. You know, all this is all because of my grandmother, my only cheerleader that really said you could do it every year, Norm. Don't give up. You can do it every year. My beautiful wife, you can do it. I said, no, no, honey. I'm tired. My feet are sore. Right, Deb? My ankles and hips are sore. I'm not going to go out there next year. No way. Somebody else. Paul, Andrew, you take that hike. I'm not going to take it. 
or somebody else take that hike. I'm not going to do it. You know, I, I just don't want to do it anymore. You know how much it costs to raise money? You know how much rejections we get? You know how much near misses we said, oh, yes? You know how much people, you know what, you got to order stuff? You got to get the, you know, I, I, I just don't want to do it anymore. I'm tired. Leave me alone. And my wife is the number one cheerer. You, you got to do it, Norm. You, you just got to do it. Who else is going to do it? You, you, you got to do it. And then I get people coming up to me, going to go on a hike. Uh, I don't want to say no to them. I'm Mr. Nice Guy. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Guess what? Start planning again. So this July, I'm going back out for my um, 12th year. Going back out for 12 years. You know what? You just ask God, help me out here, man. Don't know where the funding's going to come. Help me out, man. Don't know where you're going to get the kids. The candle's going to call you. Many are called, few are chosen. That sounds like a bingo one. <laughs> you know, the land will call you. You will, you, will, you will wake up the stories when you're on the land. You will hear and see and smell magic on the land. And that's why it's good to have the elder. The elder will tell you. The magic will wake you up to life. Life. Mother Nature will tell you. Come on, man. You got gifts that God gave you. Let's see what kind of gifts you have. You got the right stuff. So in closing, I want to say it's been a wonderful afternoon to listen to you. Believe in yourself. Have faith in yourself. Live your dreams. Pursue your dreams. You got it. You got the right stuff. Let me tell you, you got the right stuff. I want you to shake person left person left to you and person right to you, shake their hand and say, you got the right stuff. Do it now. Shake their hand and say, you got the right stuff. Thank you. Masi Cho. That was a, a wonderful presentation, and I, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't stop you. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so we have a few gifts for you. Um, thank you. Mandy. Lois. This, uh... Thank you. This gift here is going to be for the elder Jimmy, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Dillon, because all what I've known, I owe to the elder, so I want to give this gift to Jimmy Dillon. Let's see. So uh, we've gone through your break. Uh, there's about 10 minutes left. Um, so uh, you have 10 minutes for your break. If you have any questions for the panelists, um, feel free to come up and ask any questions that you may have. Um, and just as a reminder, because of the weather interruption, we have two sessions after the break, the NWT on the Land Collaborative Fund in this room and storytelling or stories from the land with Ryan McMahon in the hallway space. One.